Many Christians don't truly enjoy their journey with Jesus. They become disillusioned and discouraged because they have never understood that through it all, through the good and the bad, and the successes and the failures, everything in between, God's good work is still going on in us. And this lesson has been about discovering God's intention for what is to take place in our life in the time between we accept His gift of salvation and the final redemption of the body that takes place up there in heaven. What happens in this in-between where maybe you make a choice and you say, I'm going to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and I'm going to accept Him as my personal Savior. I want the new life that Jesus Christ can offer me. But then you discover that even though you maybe accept Christ and he, you're a new creature, you're a new person, why is it that I still will struggle at times with my flesh and with my sin? And God's Word describes for us how there can be a struggle in, the, in between of, well, I'm saved, I'm supposed to be a new person, but how come I don't always feel like it? And we've, we've been talking about that and learning about that, of how God's work in us begins at salvation, where we are, the Bible teaches us, we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. We get some new genes. Uh, instead of just the genetics from your parents, you also get the genetics of God in you. You know, you're born of the Holy Spirit of God once you accept Christ. And so you're regenerated. You are a new person. But then he begins a lifelong work within you to renew you and transform you and to make you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. One day when you get to heaven, you'll be perfectly like Jesus. One day finally up in heaven, I'll be perfectly like Jesus. And, and we'll look forward to that. But there'll be some struggles in the in-between. And we need to learn uh, about that and not be frustrated by it. But realize that God is working in us. And that God has a plan certainly uh, for us. So we are continuing a lesson from last week. And uh, we'll maybe review and go over some of the parts of this lesson. Um, that we discussed last week. And then we'll just try to finish the lesson here uh, this morning. If we make the Christian life all about us having to measure up to a certain man-made standard, we're going we're gonna to at times either be puffed up with pride because we'll compare ourselves with somebody else and think, I'm sure doing better than they are. Or we could become very frustrated or discouraged that, oh, I don't measure up. I'm not all that I ought to be. And God doesn't really want us to do either of those things. We're not to compare ourselves with others. We're just to simply allow God to work in us by His grace and transform us and change us into what He wants would have us to be. Number one in our notes was this, responding to the struggle. Responding to the struggle. How we respond to this ongoing struggle within us lies in how we answer the question, what is enough? How much is enough effort? What's enough? When have I done enough? You know, if we're evaluating things by our standard or our mentality, we'll have never done enough. We could never do enough. And so I'm glad that salvation isn't about us and the things that we do. Because no matter how much good we do, we could never do enough to erase all of our sin. We are sinners. We all have a sin nature. We were born with it. Uh, you're a sinner because that's who you are. I'm a sinner because that's who I am. Right? Uh, we, we were born in sin. We, we were born with a sin nature. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, every person ever born has been born with that sin nature. And the focus on us and in living a Christian life is not on you and me struggling within ourselves and wondering if I've done enough or could I ever do enough to earn God's favor. We said last week when it comes to responding to the struggle that there's two, two responses that we could have. Two responses we could have to the struggle. And the first one there, letter A in your notes, was try harder. Try harder. Now this is not the correct response, but it's the very natural human response. Well, I'm just going to try harder. If I failed, I'm going to try harder. But trying harder in and of our own strength is never going to get it done. It's never going to get it done. We cannot save ourselves by trying harder. We cannot make ourselves, you know, the Christian that God would have us to be by our trying harder. 
if we're just about trying harder, we're making our own measurements or climbing our own ladders to try to reach a level of success, and that's just a faulty system. That's a faulty way. The other choice, and what is the correct choice, is to rest in Jesus. So let her be in your notes. The scale of goodness that God expects is perfection. And we are sinful and weak, so we can never measure up. So what we must learn is that the only way of salvation and the only way to really enjoy the Christian life the way that he intended it is for us to rest in Jesus and rely on him to accomplish his good work in our lives. If you're always about your effort and so on, you're going to end up collapsing. You're going to end up collapsing and being frustrated and, and being like a total failure. The only proper way to collapse is to collapse, I said, into the arms of Jesus and to rest in Jesus and to trust in him to accomplish his good work in your life. Uh, number two last week was understanding the struggle. Romans chapter 7 and verse 23 says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. My members being the members of my body, okay? My eyes, my ears, you know, my tongue, and so on. In other words, the things that I see, and the things I listen to, and the things I speak, things I say, and so on, will struggle sometimes because of the, the sinfulness that is in our flesh. The sinfulness that is in this old body that even though we may get saved, we're stuck in an old sinful flesh body until we get to heaven. And God gives us a new body and a glorified body. While being saved is the most awesome thing that ever happened to you, trying to be a Christian would be the most impossible thing that you've ever attempted if you try to attempt it in yourself. If you Listen, we're saved by the Spirit, and we can't live the Christian life in the flesh. We have to live the Christian life by yielding to the Spirit of God and just letting Him have His way in our life. We said it last week that everybody who's ever been a Christian has had this struggle. There's been the struggle in between. Well, I'm a new creature. I'm a new person. But yet I struggle with the flesh. I struggle with the flesh. Number three in our notes last week was explaining the struggle. Explaining the struggle. You know, our struggle that we have is evidence of one thing, and that's that we need Christ. We need Jesus Christ. We cannot live this life without Him and be successful. We cannot live the Christian life without Him and be successful. We need Him. I said last week when we were talking about this, this third point, explaining the struggle, uh, an important statement to remember is that God's good work in me goes on. God's good work in me goes on. This is a great verse. Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in me will perform it. He's going to do it. He's going to finish it. He's going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And when you come to an understanding of your sinfulness and you accept that the Lord Jesus Christ is our only hope, our only Savior, the only way that we can be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life and a home in heaven. You come to the acceptance of that truth and you believe on Jesus and you trust Him and you are born again and you become God's child. He begins a good work in you at salvation, but He continues that work until you get to heaven. So He's not finished just with, well, I've, I've saved you. I've written your name down in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. You're my child now. No, he's begun a good work that he's going to finish. He's going to perform. He's going to do it and complete it and continue it until the day of Christ's return or the day you get to heaven, whichever comes first. We need to begin and end with confidence in Jesus. Confidence in Jesus that he is accomplishing a work in us. That good work is always happening in us, whether we at times feel it or understand it or not. We just need to believe that the work that he began in us, he's continuing in us until the day he takes us home to heaven. Many Christians will lose hope. They'll quit because they don't understand this. 
They don't understand that through it all, through their successes and failures and times when maybe we, we, we do say no to temptation or sometimes we give in to temptation and we fail. And we feel like, boy, I'm so, I'm so rotten, right? Uh, if you've ever, you know, lost your temper and had a bad spirit and had a bad attitude or, you know, started uh, yelling at your kids in a way that wasn't a godly way. It wasn't righteous indignation. It was just angry, fleshly yelling at your kids. That was sin, moms and dads, right? Or you did that to your husband or whoever, right? Your wife, right? And sometimes we feel like a failure, but, but understand God's working on us to renew us and change us and make us into what he wants us to be. The Apostle Paul walked every day of his life with the confidence that Jesus was working in him to make him what he ought to be. He knew that there was a daily struggle with the in-between of now I'm saved, now I'm a new creature, but I'm not yet perfect. And he struggled with that as well. The threefold struggle we began to study last week. Letter, letter A there under point three is called the inward man, the new me. The inward man, the new me. If you just joined us, we're on point number three in the lesson. Explaining the struggle. And under that letter A is called the inward man, the new me. Paul clearly identified his new self and the new desires that Jesus produced within him. Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 17 says this, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. The Apostle Paul says, there's things that in my spirit, my new spirit, since I've been born again, things I want to do that I don't do. Things that I don't want to do that I do. Why? Because there's this struggle now because I'm a new creature and I'm born of the spirit and, and I'm able to be, you know, do the things that are spiritual. But I, I dwell in this flesh, this flesh that still... Uh, rears its ugly head, still, still wants to uh, have its way in our life. Goes on there, Romans 7, let's look at verse 15 again, we'll begin there. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Ephesians 4.24, and that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Putting on the new man, putting off the old man. Verse, uh, sorry, Colossians 3 and verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And God describes these, uh, this, this new nature that's within us. The inward man, the inner man, the hidden man of the heart, the new man, new creature, his workmanship, Christ in me, and so on. This is the part of you that is going to encourage you to do right. There's going to be a new nature within you because the Spirit of God comes to indwell your spirit once you accept Jesus Christ. And He's going to live inside of you. And He's going to be cheering you on when it comes to doing the things that are right. When it comes to, to reading the Bible or, or, or praying or to doing something to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to be encouraging you in those things. He'll try to discourage you when it comes to those things that are just works of the flesh. Because He's trying to conform you to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he'll try to discourage you about certain things, convict you about certain things, because it's his job as the Spirit to conform you and transform you into the likeness of Jesus Christ, now that he has saved you and made you a new creature. It's God's Holy Spirit within you giving you this new nature that wants to do right and helps you to want to know God and want to glorify God and so on. Want to know the scripture. Want to know what the word of God says. Want to obey the Lord in your life. Letter B in your notes is this, the outward man, my old self. Letter B is the outward man, my old self or the flesh. 
In these next verses here, let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Paul identified the flesh and sin that still troubled him, even though his sin nature was dead. And we learn in scriptures, right, that the, the old man is crucified with Christ. But yet, Paul describes it, that that, that that flesh can still trouble us. And in Romans 7, 18 to 21, it says this, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will, the, the will to do what is good and right and spiritual and so on is present with me. But how to perform or how to do that which is good, I, I find not. I struggle sometimes. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Verse 20, now if I do th that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Over in Romans chapter 8, 8 through 11, it says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, sorry, verse 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. God uses some different terms to describe uh, the works of the flesh and, and, and some of these things that can still trouble us even after salvation. Our flesh, works of the flesh, the outward man, the lust of the flesh, sin in me, former lust. Deeds of the flesh, evil present with me, the law of sin. We said last week, it's, it's not your sin nature because Scripture clearly tells us, Paul told us, that our old nature was crucified with Christ. Our sin nature was crucified with Christ and replaced with, replaced with a new spiritual nature. He says you don't necessarily have two natures, but it is simply the fact that your flesh, you don't drop this flesh, you don't leave this flesh until you get to heaven. You're stuck in it. And all of your life, and let's say you didn't trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior until you're, you know, 20 years old or 30 years old or 40 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old, whatever. Can you imagine what it's like if you've spent so many years of your life where your, your flesh was just being trained and developed to always do what it wanted to do? Right? And say, so, you know, the flesh uh, certainly is, is, uh, needs to be uh, reprogrammed and renewed and so on and changed. And that can only take place by God's Holy Spirit. We said last week an example of how your, once you get saved, your sin nature is dead. It just doesn't know it yet. It just doesn't know it yet. When you use the example of a chicken running around with its head cut off, it doesn't know that it's dead, but it is. It is. It's just living out its final moments until it drops over and, and dies. Right? And one day, thank God, we'll no longer have to live in this flesh. Up in heaven, he gives us a new glorified body. Where we'll never struggle with sin again. Everything we do then will be ultimately pleasing to Christ. But we're in that in-between time. Let's, let's go on. This is where we, we stopped last week. And so we want to continue and finish the lesson here this morning. Letter C is the war in the middle. The war in the middle. Who wins? Who wins? Right? You've got a new spiritual nature, but you're stuck in the flesh body. Who wins? In the verses that we're going to read here, Paul explains the war going on between his new nature and his old flesh. And this is why the Christian life can be a struggle that requires some patient endurance. In Romans chapter 7, verses 23 through 25, uh, it says this, But I see another law in my members, warring against, warring, fighting against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, captivity, uh, uh, um, um, being held uh, hostage and so on, to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. What, what an awful man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God 
verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. If you're born again, God's Holy Spirit is working to try to renew the inner you. He's trying to renew, as we said in the previous lesson, your soul, your heart, your mind, your, your thinking, your way of thinking, your what you love and so on. He wants to renew that. He wants to change that day by day for the rest of your life. Over in Galatians 5, 16 through 18, he says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary. They are two completely opposing you know, thoughts and so on, ways of thinking. They're contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. In these verses, we see a war that is raging. It's a battle. It's a fight for the control of your heart and behavior. And it's being fought between the flesh and the Spirit in the battlefield of your mind. The flesh desires to bring you into captivity to sin and self. But God's Holy Spirit that now lives within your spirit after you're saved, He desires to renew your mind and to grow you in God's grace and to make you more Christ-like. God also uh, speaks to us in, about the fruit of the Spirit. But that fruit of the Spirit can only be produced in our life, of course, by Him. In Ephesians 5 and verse 9, it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. In other words, this isn't something that you can produce on your own. Right? Works of the flesh, that, that can be produced on our own. But fruit of the Spirit has to be produced by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not, it's not manufactured by your own self-will or effort. It's, it's the natural outflow, or the supernatural outflow, or the spiritual outflow of you allowing God's Holy Spirit to have control and to have His way. When you allow God's Spirit to then rule your heart... Your mind, your thinking. The fruit of the Spirit will be produced in your life. It's not something that you force or you bring about. It's something you must allow. Right? We can, we can yield to our flesh. The body that we live in, the flesh that will have its desires and lusts and so on that it seeks and wants us to give in to that. Or we can yield to the Holy Spirit of God that now lives within us once we're born again, once we're saved. And we have to yield to Him in order to produce the spiritual fruit in our life, in order to walk in the Spirit. The best version of you is a new you that is under the control and leading of the Holy Spirit of God. The worst version of you and me is where we're just being controlled by the flesh. By the flesh. Every day, you are going to be led and controlled by either one or the other. You can either be led by and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God that now lives in you because you got born again. You got saved. You received Jesus Christ. And God's Spirit came to live inside of you, Jim Sheet. He came to live inside of you. But this week, right, are we going to let the Spirit of God have His way? Or are we going to give in to our flesh and let the flesh have its way? You know, the flesh always did those things that were pleasing to itself. But the Holy Spirit of God wants to help us to do those things that are be pleasing to God. It's going to depend on who you allow to rule. 
Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 says this. Know ye not... He says, do you not know this? Do you not understand this? Know ye not that to whom, or that means to whomever, right? To who? To whomever ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Are you going to yield to the flesh or yield to the Spirit? Every moment, every day, you must choose who you're going to follow in life, your flesh or God's Holy Spirit. It sounds like you must lose your individual identity, but that's not true. You are never more fully who God designed you to be than when you fully surrender yourself to God's Holy Spirit. When God is ruling in your heart, He lives out the character of Jesus Christ through your unique personality. Does God want uh, Paul and Raphael and Jonathan and Dennis, you know, and, and Denver and so on? Does He all want all each of them to be exactly like me or a carbon copy of me? No. He wants them to be Paul and Jonathan and Raphael and Dennis in Denver. Their personality, the unique individual that God made them, but same as me. He wants all of us to be men who will be yielding to the Spirit of God and letting Him have control, letting Him have His way in our life, letting Him make us into the man that God wants Paul to be as a Holy Spirit filled, Holy Spirit led believer. When God is ruling in your heart, He lives out the character of Jesus through your unique personality. He maximizes your strengths and He minimizes your weaknesses. It's not like you just trying to be like some other Christian. It's us yielding to the Spirit of God and letting Him make us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on. Number four, benefiting from the struggle. Number four, benefiting from this struggle. Number four, benefiting from the struggle. It's strange to think that there are actually some blessings from this struggle. You say, how can there be blessings in this? Man, I get so frustrated by this. The struggle is a part of God's design for the Christian journey and us growing in grace. When God saved you, He could have made all three parts of you new in that moment, but He didn't. He, he, gave, he made you new in your spirit, that you're regenerated, you're born of the spirit. But then there's a lifelong transformation of where your soul, your heart and your mind and your thinking and so on. He's working on changing that for the rest of your life. He will give you a, a, a perfect body, a glorified body where you won't ever struggle with the flesh again up there in heaven. So he, the, the changing you... There's a, there's, a, there's a gradualness to some of the aspects of it. Even though He does, does change you and make you a new creature the moment you accept Jesus Christ and you're born again. But then He spends the rest of your life renewing you and changing you. Having a new nature, new spiritual nature, having a new mind, having a new body and so on, that takes place in a moment, a moment of faith. This is going to take place over the rest of your life. The new body takes place once you're up there with Him. God designed the work of salvation, understanding how we've been describing it in these lessons, to be three parts that take place over a lifetime. It's God's plan, and in many ways it's beyond our limited understanding. But the Word of God gives us insight into how God uses this struggle to accomplish His ultimate purpose. Let's go through some things here quickly as we finish this lesson this morning. Here are some ways that the struggle brings blessing. Here are some ways that we can benefit from the struggle. Letter A in your notes there, the struggle highlights God's grace. The struggle highlights God's grace. It's God turning bad things into good. It's reconciliation. 
In the same chapter where God details the struggle of us yielding to the Holy Spirit, he also tells us this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God turning bad things into good. Letter B, the struggle teaches me to walk in the Spirit. The struggle will teach me to walk in the Spirit. Th that I need to learn to depend upon God. Right? Lean upon the Lord. I can't live this Christian life in my own strength or in my own flesh. You, don't, you, don't, you can't produce fruit of the Spirit in the flesh. You produce works of the flesh in the flesh. And so the struggle teaches me to walk in the, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. It keeps me dependent upon God and yielding to His Spirit. It compels me to ask Him daily, fill me, God. I need to be filled with Your Holy Spirit. I want to be controlled by You. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ephesians 5 and verse 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the, with the Spirit the Holy Spirit of God. Don't, don't allow yourself to be under the influence and control of this. He says instead you now start allowing yourself to be under the influence and under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. What a blessed life. Let her see. What does the struggle teach us? How can we benefit from it? Let her see. The struggle keeps me growing in my relationship with Jesus. The struggle keeps me growing in my relationship with Jesus. Some of you began a relationship with Jesus Christ. You entered into a relationship with God. Maybe so many days ago or so many weeks ago. Right? Praise the Lord. But you need to grow in that relationship and God wants to help you. My susceptibility to sin compels me to walk with Him personally. It's what will keep me needy and realizing I, I need Him. If I'm to be growing in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going gonna, it's gonna to urge me... And compel me that, you know what, I need to read the Word of God. Right? Uh, Jam Sheet, I, I, I'm a new believer now, right? I've been born again. I have a relationship with God. I'm His child now. I want to grow in Jesus. How can I grow in Jesus? i got to get in His Word. i got to learn His Word. And so I can open up my Bible. I can open up God's Word on Monday. Maybe, maybe in between morning work or in between evening work. Or if I can just take some moments and read God's Word and learn some things about Jesus and grow in my walk with Jesus. Why do I do that? Be because I have to do it? Or just because I'm required to do it? No. Is it because, well, that's what a good Christian will do? No, it's because I love Him and I need Him. I need Jesus. Right? And so that's why you'll want to spend time in His Word. There are things that should be produced in our lives because we love Him. And our love for Jesus makes me desire to grow in grace and to obey God's Word. The Christian life is not about have to do this, have to do this, have to do this. No, I get to do this. I'm a child of God. I have a relationship with God that I never had before. And I want to grow in my relationship with God. I want to grow in my walk with Jesus Christ. And so she says, oh, I get to go to church. I get to read God's Word. Oh! The God of the universe, the Creator, He wrote a book that I can read. He wrote a book that tells me about His love for me. I want to read that. I want to get to know Him better. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. I'm glad we can grow in grace. I'm glad you're here this morning. That encourages my heart so much. Letter D this morning. The struggle reveals the high value of his work within me. The struggle reveals the high value of his work within me. The struggle is an indicator that God's word is true. And that there's something uh, very dangerous about not walking with Jesus. Spiritual warfare is very real. 
Satan, the devil, and the demons of hell oppose us. The Holy Spirit of God is working to transform us to be like Christ. There is a spiritual dimension to life in which there is much to lose to sin and there's so much to gain in Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 it says, And let us not be weary. Weary. Don't, don't, don't just grow weary or tired and give up and quit. Let us not be weary in well-doing, in doing what is well, in doing what is good, in doing what is right. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We don't faint. We don't quit. We, we don't give up. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26 says, and this is speaking about Moses esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater treasures, uh, sorry, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the, the recompense of the reward. What would be the, the recompense or the, the compensation? Right? The compensation for having lived for Jesus. What would be the reward or the compensation for having done what is right and lived for God and so on? What blessings there can be in your life if you've lived for God? And Moses made a choice. We don't got time to talk about the story. But he made the choice. I'd rather have the rewards and the compensation and blessing of God in my life than, than all the what sin can give me, what the pleasures of sin can give me and so on. Letter E. Let's go on. We've got to finish here soon. Letter E. The struggle keeps me hoping for heaven and home. The struggle keeps me hoping for heaven and home. It's easy to become complacent and satisfied with this short life. God has something much better in store for you. And he calls you to set your affection on things above. To set your affection upon himself. To set your affection on heaven. He calls you to live for a higher hope. The war or the struggle keeps me longing for home. Longing for heaven. Longing for the day when, man, I, I won't sin again, right? The struggle will help us to always be longing for and looking forward to, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to finally be perfect and be like Jesus Christ. So there's some benefits to the struggle. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Let's go to a letter F there. The struggle keeps me magnifying Jesus. The struggle keeps me magnifying Jesus. You know what the word magnify is? You, do you know what a, a magnifying glass is? You look through that and it makes something look so much bigger. Our lives are to magnify Jesus. Make him big. Make him awesome. The struggle keeps me magnifying Jesus. How could my Christian struggle glorify and magnify Jesus? Through faith. Because it causes us to live by faith. To demonstrate faith. Faith is what Jesus acknowledges in your life. And, and your faith in the struggle, your absolute refusal to give up or to quit trusting Him is going to bring Him glory. You're trusting Him. You're being steadfast and pressing on for the Lord Jesus Christ is going to magnify Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Keep living a life of faith. Keep living a life of trusting God, and you will magnify the Lord. Letter G. Letter G. We're talking about some benefits from the struggle that there is. Letter G. The struggle keeps me authentic in Christian relationships. What does the word authentic mean? Real. Right? Real. The struggle will keep me authentic. It'll keep me real in, in my relationships. Christianity is often troubled with the same trouble as the lost. Some people become so concerned with, with their image 
and their appearance that they become more concerned with what their image is than their reality. Do you know what LinkedIn and you know social media does? Helps you to present some image. Sometimes the image may not be the reality. <laughs> You can design a website that makes you seem like you are the most incredible uh, person and got the most incredible business ever. You can do that. You can do anything on social media or websites, right? But then people come to actually see your business or see you or get to know you. They may leave a little disappointed. We're not just to be concerned about, well, what image am I projecting? We're to be concerned with what's the reality? What's the reality of what I am and where I'm at and how God's changing me and how God's making me? You know, I, I've said it before. The Christian life is not to be a model of perfection. It's to be a model of redemption. Our church is certainly not a model of perfection, but I hope, hope people will see that it's a, it's a place of redemption where lives can be redeemed, where broken lives can be fixed. Your marriage, I know it's not a picture of perfection because mine isn't either, but I hope it becomes a great picture of redemption. Because will our marriages be perfect? No, but I hope there's redemption. I hope there's some love and patience being shown. I hope that there's mercy and grace freely flowing. I, I hope there's forgiveness being offered in our homes and us seeking forgiveness, right? Redemption is such a better picture of what the reality of our life is to be like. Not perfection. And we, we, we are to be authentic in our relationships. We should be less concerned with what people think we are and more concerned with what God knows about us. If we descend or we lower ourselves into just some game of where we compare ourselves with other or we judge ourselves against other others, well, the Bible clearly teaches that's wrong. In every case, these games would go away if we would just be authentic and real about the struggles in our lives. About the time that I would want to accuse somebody else or blame somebody else, we would remember then just how broken I am or how broken I was and how God redeemed me and how God rescued me and how God helped me. We won't be feeling so high and mighty and proud of ourselves if we realize just how much God is gracious and merciful and patient with us and so long-suffering and so forgiving. The Bible tells us in Romans 14, verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, held up. For God is able to make him stand. James 5 and verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I believe there's a certain measure of wisdom and carefulness in, in what we do and how we do and what we, so, so on. But you know, the Bible doesn't tell us about being boastful and proud. He tells us there ought to be enough humility in every Christian. There ought to be enough Christ-likeness in every Christian that I could go to you and you could go to me and say, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling. I'm weak in this area. And brother, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me. And you wouldn't judge me and point at me and, man, what a, what a rotten pastor I have. <laughs> Well, he, man, I didn't know he was such a rotten sinner. No. That there would never be, we don't judge. We, we support each other. We help each other. We pray for one another. Real. Real faith. Let's, let's go on here. Last one. Uh, the struggle keeps me small so he can be big. The struggle keeps me small so he can be big. The Christian life is a downward cycle of continually humbling myself before God and others. 
My struggle keeps me familiar with my weaknesses and my brokenness. The longer I struggle, the smaller I become in my own estimation, and the larger God's grace becomes. This is healthy as long as it compels dependence and not discouragement. You know, we all will have a tendency in our flesh to want glory for ourselves. Even as we grow in grace, we may, in our flesh, want to measure ourselves in glory in our own goodness. We may think highly of our progress and compare ourselves to others, but it's a game that will rob God of all the credit and all the glory that He deserves. If there's anything good in my life today, it's because of the Lord. If there's anything that's been done that has changed me or made me a new man, it's because the Lord and His goodness and grace and what He has done to work in my life and change me. Anything good. You become great in your parenting. You become great in your doing this or doing that. It's going to be if it's the Lord's grace and power working in us and changing us and helping us to be the mom we ought to be. Or helping us to be the dad we ought to be. Helping us, you know, whatever area of life. We have nothing to glory about. If there's ever anything good in our lives, it's going to be because God did it and God changed us. God deserves all the glory. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me he can do nothing. John 3, 30, John said about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus, he must increase. But I must decrease. There are many days when we're tired of the struggle within. We get tired of the kind of the hard side, the hard aspect of the struggle uh, in the Christian journey. But on those days, you'll find that the struggle is often a function of our own pride or false expectations. The burden may be because of some self-imposed thing where we're setting upon ourselves. That is not something that God expects. Jesus invites you to rest in Him. To rest in Him. Matthew 11 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You're, you're burdened down. He says, And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus doesn't expect us to do the good work in us. Because He is already doing it. He doesn't expect us to do the work in us of changing us. He wants us to let Him do it. Usually when we're discouraged, it's because we've misappropriated this truth. We've taken matters into our own hands. We are trying to make fruit grow on our own. We're trying to produce spiritual fruit in our flesh. We're trying to force maturity, spiritual maturity to happen. All of our self-efforts will always set us up for failure and frustration and discouragement. God's plan is this, totally yielding to Him. Yielding to the Spirit of God that now comes and lives inside of you once you accept Jesus Christ. You are totally depending on Him because when you fail, He can pick you up. When you succeed, He gets the glory. Through it all, every success and struggle, He is doing a good work in you. Is the Christian life a wonderful life? Yes, it is. It's a wonderful life, but we've learned in these, this lesson that there, it can be a warring life. That there can be a fight between the new you and your new spiritual nature and the fact that you're stuck in this body, this flesh, until you get to heaven. Two things so important. There are two things that can help to make the war or the struggle bearable. The first is that knowing that one day, one day there's victory. And the second, knowing that through it all, God's good work is going on and continuing in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us now with these truths. May you be glorified. May you grow us by your grace to make us more like Jesus Christ. Help us to yield to you, surrender to you, rest in Jesus. Help us to respond properly to the struggle within us. We cannot win it in our own fight or in our own flesh. So help us to yield to the Spirit and let Him have His way in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.